have a Bible, I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32 and and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you could kind of have both of them ready in just a second, we're going to read them back to back. While you're turning there, let me just express <clears throat> my gratitude for this seminary. I'm so thankful for your president and his friendship to me, his investment in me, the same for Dr. Moore, his encouragement to me, and so many other faculty here. I'm so thankful for what God is doing in and through this seminary as I interact with brothers and sisters who have gone out from here and are serving in different churches. As I interact, I think about being in Southeast Asia among an unreached people group recently and interacting with a couple who had been at the seminary. So interacting with folks from here who have gone around the world, I just praise God for the army he is sending out from this place. And you know that you are blessed to be a part of this seminary. And you know that to whom much is given, much is required. So may God's grace in Southern Seminary resound to his glory in the world. I wanna be a bit vulnerable with you this morning, maybe in a way that I, I wouldn't necessarily be just in any place with any group of people. I have been a pastor now just for almost six years and I have so much to learn and so far to go. There are, are doubtless even in this room brothers who have pastored for far longer than I have who have far more wisdom than I do that could or maybe even should be standing here right now. But one thing I have learned is that pastoral ministry is spiritual war. And if I could be a bit vulnerable this morning in sharing that this last year in particular, in my sh short six years in pastoral ministry, this last year has been in many ways, at many times, the most difficult and at times very discouraging years for me in life and ministry for a variety of reasons, the specifics I won't, I won't go into this morning, but, but I'd like to share this morning from the overflow of that. There are some things in Exodus 32 and 1 Corinthians 10 that really highlight some of the things that I wrestle with in pastoral ministry in my life in my leadership, and in the church that God has entrusted me to lead. So with that background, come with me to Exodus chapter 32, and we'll start in verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast of the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, go down. For your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf 
and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. All right, now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're gonna come back to Exodus 32, but I want you to see in 1 Corinthians 10 where Paul references Exodus chapter 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll start in verse six. Paul writes, now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. And here he quotes from Exodus 32, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so you may be able to endure it. So hear what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 10 about Exodus chapter 32. He's saying what happened back here is an example for you. It is written down as instruction to you, in a very real sense as a warning to you which is key, we have an, a tendency, a dangerous tendency, to look at passages like Exodus 32, people worshiping a golden calf, and we wonder, what were they thinking? How could they do that? Worship a golden calf, and Paul jumps in our face and says, take heed lest you fall. Because the temptations that they were giving into are the temptations that are common in your life and in the ministry God has entrusted to you and me. So Paul is telling us here, Exodus 32 is a warning to us of what need, we need to watch out for in our lives, in our leadership, in the church. And so, just as we read earlier from Jeremiah, Dr. Moore prayed for us as a people whose lives are immersed in the worship of false gods. I'd like to put before you this morning four golden calves, so to speak, based on Exodus chapter 32 that tempt us in our lives, in our leadership, and in ministry. Number one. Coming back to Exodus 32. We are tempted to lead without conviction. We're tempted to lead without conviction. So back here in Exodus 32, you remember the setup. Israelites living as slaves in Egypt, God sees their suffering and delivers them miraculously through plague after plague after plague culminating in the Passover. And then he brings them out, brings them to the edge of the Red Sea. He splits a sea in half and sends his people through on dry land. They look in their rearview mirrors and the waters come crashing down on the Egyptians. They are hungry and he gives them bread out of the sky, bread from heaven. They are thirsty and he gives them water from a rock. 
He's leading them with a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. Just can you, I mean, these are not just stories, but can you imagine that? He brings them to a mountain where he reveals his glory before them and the consuming fire. He gives his law to them, enters into covenant with them. And he brings Moses up on the mountain to meet with him as he gives his word to him. And just days after all of that, you come to verse one and it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, they they gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods. This Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Just like that. The people of God who had seen his glory and seen his salvation and seen his goodness and his grace in a matter of days are are going to their leader and saying, we need to make some false gods to worship. And the dangerous thing is the leader gave a sinful people exactly what they wanted. Get your stuff together. We will worship a golden calf. The leader gave a sinful people exactly what they wanted. I am convinced that in our day, we have created an entire church leadership model that revolves around giving sinful people what they want. The name of the game in the church today is felt needs. What do people want? I remember when I, I was first writing some of the stuff that ended up becoming the little orange book and I was, I was writing it just for the purpose of serving the church at Brook Hills. I wanted to put down on paper some of the things we were walking through in the word so that people who come five years from now into our church would would know why we're doing things the way we're doing them. What are the foundations that have been laid? Then it got into some other hands and some people expressed interest in publishing it. But when I began to talk to publishers, the first question they would always ask is, well, what is the felt need that is being addressed here? And I would, either in person or on the phone, I would say there's four and a half plus billion people in the world who are without Christ and going to hell. Do we feel that need? And they would say, well, no. People don't walk into a bookstore wondering how their life is going to impact the world for the glory of Christ. We need to come up with a felt need to pull people into the book. It's what the Christian marketplace is built around. It's what so many Christian churches revolve around. The reality is you and I are tempted at every turn to revolve our lives and our ministries around giving sinful people what they want. We are tempted to manage a cultural Christianity that prioritizes man-centered traditions over God-centered truth. We are tempted to espouse a cheap Christianity that promises people everything and costs people nothing. We are tempted to give in to a crowd-pleasing Christianity that, that makes people feel good about idolatrous devotion to money, big houses, nice cars, possessions, sex, sports, and success. And it's not just the people of God who are lured by these things. It's the leaders of the people of God who are lured by these things. We are in this place as a church because of leaders without conviction. Ian Bounds once wrote, the church of God makes or is made by its leaders. Whether it makes them or is made by them, the church will be what its leaders are. A church rarely revolts against or rises above the religion of its leaders. It's a humbling thing to consider just how much the church that I lead is a reflection of my life. So, without going into specifics, let me speak generally. 
Over the past six years, we have experienced some of the key leaders in our church falling to moral failure. I think of one in particular, a brother, close friend, comes out that he has fallen into moral failure. This is a brother who I, I love, still love, obviously still love, and, and is so gifted. A brother who I, I would think to myself, I don't know if we could ever replace that guy if something were to happen to him. And so when it comes out that he has fallen into moral failure, I'm ashamed to admit to you this morning that the first thought that went through my mind is, how can we make a way for him to stay? Can't lose this guy. And I remember the moment, I remember where I was sitting. It wasn't an audible voice from heaven, but a clear message based on his word. When God said to me, David, I am more interested in the sanctity of this people than I am in the success of your ministry. And it is absolutely true. God is far more interested in the sanctity of his people than he is in the worldly success of our ministries. We are tempted though at every turn to lead without conviction. Second, we are tempted to celebrate salvation without dedication. We are tempted to celebrate salvation without dedication. So in Egypt, the people of God were surrounded by idols everywhere, including idols like this golden calf. But God saved them from that. He delivered them out of Egypt. But upon their deliverance, the first opportunity they have, they're running back to the gods that they used to worship in Egypt. And here's what's interesting. Did you notice when we read this text that while they were indulging in their sin, they were celebrating their salvation? Verse four, he received the gold from their hands, fashioned with a graving tool, made a golden calf, and they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. That's the same language that God used in Exodus chapter 20, verse one, to say, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. So don't miss it. The blood of the covenant had hardly even had time to dry, and they're dancing around the calf, claiming salvation while indulging in sin, celebrating salvation with no dedication. It's a story that is not foreign to us. It's a story that is repeated time and time again in our churches. People indulging in sin for years, yet thinking, well, I, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I prayed that prayer, so I am okay. Should it concern us that the Bible never calls us to ask Jesus into our hearts? Should it concern us that the Bible never mentions such a superstitious sinner's prayer? And yet this is exactly what we have sold and proclaimed to so many as salvation. And as a result, there are hosts of people in our churches who think that they are eternally saved from their sins when they are not. Matthew 7 haunts me as a pastor. Many will say to me, not some, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these things in your name? And I will tell them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Spiritual deception is dangerous. Spiritual deception is damning. We have communicated salvation without dedication. In our efforts to reach as many people as possible with the gospel, 
We are tempted to malign the very gospel we seek to reach them with, to reduce it to a shrink-wrapped presentation that if they can say the right things back to us or pray the right things back to us, we can pronounce them saved and move on. When this is not the picture of biblical salvation, that is modern evangelism built on sinking sand and it is disillusioning millions of souls. The gospel confronts sinners with the law of God, with the lordship of Christ, and causes people to cry. I'm not saying it's bad to pray a prayer. <laughs> prayer, crying out to God for salvation is certainly, is certainly warranted when we see the glory of God and we see our own sinfulness and we see the wonder of Christ. But it's calling out to Him, not in some rote words that someone has told us to repeat. And it's not asking Him or inviting Him to come into our life. This is us saying you are a savior who is worthy of more than me asking or accepting you. You are a savior who is worthy of infinite glory and honor and I have not given it to you in my life and you, you have done what it takes to save me from my sins and I surrender everything to you. Nowhere in scripture does God intend to save us without dedicating all of us to himself, right? So let us in the midst of that kind of temptation to celebrate salvation without dedication, let's preach the gospel as gracious and glorious. Yes, as gracious. Let us tell people there is nothing you can do to be saved from your sins. Christ has done it all. Preach Christ as gracious. At the same time, preach him as glorious. He is a savior who's worthy of more than church attendance and casual association and nominal adherence. He is a savior who is worthy of complete adoration and total abandonment. Preach the gospel, not in a way that produces lazy Christians who sit around and, and say, well, I'm saved from my sins. I'm covered while there are billions who haven't even heard the gospel. Let us preach the gospel in a way that does not produce lazy or on the other hand, licentious Christians who say, well, in, in Christ, I'm free to do whatever I want. No. In Christ, we are free to do whatever he wants. That's what it means to be saved. So let's preach the gospel under the Spirit of God in a way that doesn't produce lazy or licentious Christians, but Christians who long for the glory of God to be made known in and through their lives among all the world. Salvation with dedication. We are tempted to, to celebrate one without the other. Third temptation. We are tempted to manufacture worship without humiliation. We are tempted to manufacture worship without humiliation, as if this story could not startle us more. You get down to verse five, and it says, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. He built an altar place of worship, and he announced tomorrow there will be a feast, a festival to the Lord. The next day they sacrifice burnt offerings. They bring peace offerings. Do you see this? They are taking the guidelines for the worship of God and using those guidelines to worship an idol. Even to the point of calling the idol the Lord. They had everything you would think of when it comes to worship. The only thing they've missed is God. They had all the forms, but they had completely forgotten the object. All the forms of worship, ignoring, turning a deaf ear to the object of worship. And there is no question, a temptation to do the exact same thing in our lives and the churches that we lead. You look at the landscape today, what does it take to have a, a good worship service? 
good music, likable songs, a good speaker, a good setting, an environment. Put all of these things together and you will have a worship service. But you remember in the Old Testament what it took to have a worship service. You remember Nehemiah chapter eight when all it took was Ezra taking the book and standing up and opening it. All he did was open the book and all of a sudden everybody stood to their feet, bowed to the ground, their faces on the floor crying out, you are worthy, you are worthy. All he'd done was open the book. And they fell to their faces in worship. Brothers and sisters, just as a reminder to us, the word of God is fully sufficient to incite the worship of God. This word does the work. Tozer, once said, in my opinion, the greatest single need of the moment is that light-hearted, superficial religionists be struck down with a vision of God, high and lifted up with his train filling the temple. The holy art of worship seems to have passed away like the Shekinah glory from the tabernacle. And as a result, we are left to our own devices and forced to make up a lack of spontaneous worship by bringing in countless cheap and tawdry activities to hold the attention of the church people. Oh, brothers and sisters, we do not need cheap and tawdry activities to hold the attention of the church people. The greatness of our God is more than enough to hold the attention of the church people. The greatness of our God is more than enough to incite the affections of church people. So, is the object of our worship central? in a way that provokes Nehemiah ch chapter eight kind of experiences. Where are the Ezra's who even back in the book of Ezra fell to his knees before God with his hands spread out saying, I'm too disgraced to even lift my head. Where are the pictures of Isaiah in our worship crying out, woe is me, I'm unclean before God. Where is weeping in our worship? Where is brokenness and humility and deep confession in our worship? Are these things weeping, brokenness, humbly falling on our faces before God? Are these things too extreme for us? If weeping and brokenness and humility do not have a place in our worship, then God will not have a place in our worship. Amen. Yet we are tempted to manufacture worship without humiliation before God. Fourth, we are tempted to lead without conviction, to celebrate salvation without dedication. We are tempted to manufacture worship without humiliation. And we are tempted to create a God without retribution. We're tempted to create a God without retribution. This is the beauty of the golden calf. Set up an altar, give offerings, indulge in revelry, and nothing would happen. What would this calf do? R.C. Sproul said the cow gave no law and demanded no obedience. It had no wrath or justice or holiness to be feared. It was deaf, dumb, and impotent. But at least it could not intrude on their fun and call them to judgment. This was a religion designed by men, practiced by men, and ultimately useless for men. And God responds in verse nine and says, I have seen this people, it is a stiff-necked people, now let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. You and I know that we are living in a day where the wrath of God is maligned, questioned, doubted, in many cases, virtually ignored. We say things like, that was a hell of a game. 
that was a hell of a song or we had a hell of a time the way we talk about hell shows that we have no idea what we are talking about the wrath of God toward sinners is real. And the reality of hell is horrible. Fear him, Jesus says, fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Hell. Demonstration of the wrath and justice of God towards sinners. The Bible tells us a place of fiery agony. Mark 9, 43. You know this. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter your life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. You're struggling with sin, cut your eye out, it's better. In the place where the fire is never quenched. You say, well you do you take that verse literally, verses like this to talk about smoke of torment and burning fire. Aren't these just images? Aren't these just symbols? Well, maybe. What if they are symbols? then what are they symbols for? A snowy retreat? (laughs) Comfortable vacation? If they are symbols, the whole purpose of a symbol is to represent something which is much worse, which cannot be described in mere words. Clearly, these are symbols of a horrifying place to be. A place of conscious torment, Luke 16, 22 through 24. A place of darkness, Matthew 22, 13. A place of eternal duration, Matthew 25, 46. Revelation 14, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. It was said that when George Whitfield preached, listeners were urged to consider the torment of burning like a livid coal, not for an instant or for a day, but for millions and millions of ages, at the end of which people will realize that they are no closer to the end than when they first begun, and they will never, ever be delivered from that place. Brothers and sisters, we are not just playing games here. This is not just about getting a degree, finishing assignments, going into a church or into a position and leading. There is a spiritual battle that is waging for the souls of men and women in Louisville, Kentucky, in Birmingham, Alabama, and all around the world. To use language from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, there is a God in this world, little g, God in this world, who is blinding the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the glory of God in Christ. That's verse 4. Verse 6, there's a True God, capital G, God over this world who is shining light into hearts. Little g, God in this world, blinding minds. True God over this world, shining light into hearts. There is a God, little g, God in this world who wants every single person in this room, every single person in your community, every single person among the nations to burn forever in hell. 
There is a true God over this world who wants us, 2 Peter 3, 9, he wants all people, desires all people to be saved and to know the light of Christ. That's verse four, that's verse six. What's verse five? We're right in the middle, and Paul says we are preaching Christ. Do you realize, we're on the front lines of spiritual warfare. It's going on here, it's going on around 11,690 plus people groups in the world. And we are not just playing games and we do not have time to waste our lives on anything less than absolute devotion on the front lines to preaching Christ. And that is the whole point of Exodus 32, right? We clearly need a savior. It's them, it's their hearts, it's us, it's our hearts. We need a savior and praise be to God, he has sent his son. And his son never once succumbed to temptation. And he never once gave in to the evil one. And yet he chose, the very son of God chose to take the retribution do you and me upon himself. Praise Jesus for standing where you and I deserve to stand as our substitute. So let us fall before him in humble worship Let's weep over our sin, refuse to gloss over our sin. Let us weep before him and worship. And we humble ourselves before him. Son of God lifts us up. Let us realize that we have been saved not to indulge in sin. We have been saved to abandon everything in our lives for his glory and for his name's sake. He is worthy of the praise of all 11,690 people groups. So let's give our lives making his glory known among all of them, no matter what it costs, because we know that any risk involved is nothing compared to the reward that is found in Christ. And let us then, with that, lead church with conviction even when it is not easy, even when it is discouraging, and even when it is difficult. Let's refuse to spend our lives giving sinful people what they want and indulging the sinful desires of our hearts in the process. Let us, with conviction, stand on the authority of God's word. Trust in the power of God's presence and and lead the church for the glory of God's name. Will you pray with me? Lord, God, I confess in this room my desperate need for you. We confess. We are people prone to sin, we are prone to wander. We're prone to settle. We are weak people. And so in our heads, and as we bow our heads and in our hearts, we, we say to you this morning, we need your grace, we need your mercy. And we want your glory to be made known in our lives. So help us, we pray, help us to lead with conviction with confidence in your word, even when it is not easy. Help us to preach the gospel clearly in our day and to fight against spiritual deception in the church. Help us, we pray, in our worship, not to become routine, but to worship with humility and brokenness before you. May your greatness be at the center of our worship. And in the process, we pray that you would show 
the wonder of your mercy. As we magnify your character, including your wrath, we pray that you would magnify your son as the one who took the wrath we deserve. All glory be to your name, Lord Jesus, for saving us from our sins. Use us, we pray, to make your grace and glory known to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.